It's uh, great to be here tonight. I want to tell you a little bit about uh, what went into my thinking in starting SKS Microfinance to give you a feel for what the for-profit model within social enterprise is all about. And I want to do this because I started SKS Microfinance in 1998. And after all, at that time in the 1990s, it's not that microfinance was new. Professor Mohammed Yunus of the Grameen Bank in Bangladesh had already taught the world that if you give a small loan, $100, $200, $300 loan to a poor woman, and she started a small business, she could earn income and step by step help improve her family. In fact, I was inspired by that model, so right after college I went back to my native place in India and worked for one of these microfinance NGOs. I was basically a field worker, giving out loans, collecting repayments, and seeing firsthand this tremendous impact that a $100 or $200 microfinance loan could make. But I also saw what I thought was a fundamental flaw, a fatal error in microfinance. And that is that it just wasn't scaling to large numbers. Now this problem hit home to me because when I was out in the field doing this microfinance work, many women from more remote villages would come and ask if we could start in their village. I remember one woman, very poor, emaciated, torn sari, she walked barefoot for quite a distance to come meet me, and she asked if we could start in her village. She had this idea to start a small village grocery store, a home front grocery store. And like many poor people, though she was quite poor, she had that spark in her eye. You knew that if you gave her a chance, she could really do something. So I went back and I asked our head of our NGO, you know, can we expand? And he said, no, we, we only have a limited pool of, of funding. We can't go beyond the 30 villages that we're in. So I went back and I, I told this woman, unfortunately, we can't, we can't start in your village. She looked, me, she looked at me and said something that I will never forget. She said, Am I not poor too? Do I not deserve a chance to get my family out of poverty? She wasn't asking for a handout. She wasn't asking for a dole. She was simply asking for an opportunity. And her question to me seemed absolutely right. In fact, I was so jarred by her question that I actually left my NGO went on to do a PhD program where I tried to answer her question, which I reframed as, how do you design microfinance in a way that you never have to say no to any poor person who's simply asking for an opportunity? And I studied microfinance around the world, and the thought occurred to me that rather than structure it as a, for, as a nonprofit entity, if you structure it as a for-profit, instead of giving interest-free loans, charge interest to borrowers, tapped into debt and equity and eventually to public markets, then you could access this unlimited pool of capital and reach out not to hundreds, but not even thousands, but hundreds of thousands, perhaps even millions of poor people across the world. So that's what I set out to do in 1998. I went back to India, to my native place, started this, this work, and in the first year we reached 160 borrowers, 10 villages. Slowly, step by step, put in the system, started to scale. Finally, by 2004, we hit our first break-even year. At that time, we had about 120,000 clients and about an $18 million portfolio. Then venture capitalists started becoming interested in us. We received venture funding from two of the premier Silicon Valley venture capitalists, Vinod Koshla and Sequoia Capital. After more hard work, finally 2010, we did our IPO and the Bombay Stock Exchange. And just after our IPO, we were at our peak of 7.2 million borrowers, over $5 billion dispersed, 97% repayment rate, all unsecured loans. We had 27,000 staff covering nearly 15,000 villages across the country and a market cap of $2.2 billion. Now those, now those numbers are exciting. But what was most satisfying about what we were able to catalyze 
was that now we had an answer to that question that that poor woman asked me many years ago. Once we did our IPO, we and the other MFIs in the country could say to not only that poor woman, but to any poor person in the country, yes, you too can have an opportunity. How much do you need to start your small business? If I could have the slides. These are some of our borrowers, some of our groups, uh, and you can see the, the kind of activities that they're involved with. You can scroll the slides. Now, I must say that while you look at these slides, after our IPO, all was not well. There was a fierce political backlash against microfinance. Today, SKS Microfinance is serving only 5 million clients, so we've, we've actually come down and the sector has contracted. I don't have time tonight to go into that details of that political backlash and, and what, what happened. But what I can say is that the market-based approach to create social impact still works. These women, these groups are a testament to that. But I can also say that when the private sector is working with vulnerable populations at the base of the pyramid and the regulation hasn't caught up, it's up to us as a sector to set those rules and norms until the regulation catch, catches up. That, in fact, is the subject of my second book, which I'm working on. But let me come back to tonight's discussion. Tonight, what I want to say is that all the success that SKS had, all the people that we reached, all of the other MFIs who we inspired, none of that could have happened without the support of Echoing Green and without the support of all of you in this room. Before venture capitalists invested in SKS, before the Wall Street Journal and CNN covered us, there was one group that believed in my idea of a for-profit microfinance organization when the idea was simply words on a piece of paper, and that was Echoing Green. At the time I received the Echoing Green, we can applaud Echoing Green. Okay. At the time I received the Echoing Green Fellowship, I was a graduate student in Chicago saddled with debt. There's no way I could have come back to India and set this up if not for that Echoing Green Fellowship. The money may have seemed small, $30,000 a year for two years, but what it gave me was invaluable, the time and the space to come back and test these ideas in the field. Now, I'm just one of many fellows to have been supported by Echoing Green, particularly in areas where you're blurring the lines between for-profit and non-profit and doing hybrid work. In fact, in 2007, Equine Green funded its first fellow with a for-profit model, Felix Brandon Lloyd, founder of Skill Life. And today, the Equine Green portfolio has, on average, about 40% of its fellows doing for-profit or hybrid work. These for-profit and hybrid fellows are mostly international, mostly penetrating new markets, mostly in the developing world. They are redefining the frontiers of innovation and products and service distribution to the most vulnerable populations. They're figuring out how to unleash that economic potential that lies in the periphery. Many of the for-profit Echoing Green Fellows have actually seen a lot of success in their models. Some have sold their businesses, some have garnered significant investment, and all of them in one way or the other redefining how we think about business and how we think about capitalism. We're st still early in this process, however. And it's this next generation of Echoing Green Fellows, of social entrepreneurs who are going to innovate and take us to the next level. So some of the mistakes that I made post-IPO, they won't make when they go post-IPO. The potential future impact is represented here today with the four finalists in this segment. And I have the great pleasure and honor of introducing them, if I could ask them to come.